All right, all right, all right. Yes. Yes, I am a Longhorn. My name's <laughs> Hook'em Horns. Uh, anyways, so my name's Adam Gafkin. I'm a financial advisor with Edward Jones just up the road in Lakeway. And uh, we just, you know, Edward Jones wants to welcome you all here. Thank you all for your support uh, coming out today, uh, just enjoying your time. And I think one of the biggest things I'm seeing right now is just, just the realness, just how fun it, it's being, just the uh, communication that's taking place and uh, just the, the amazing people that we're getting to work with. Um, I, one of the big things I want to say is, you know, Kat has been wonderful through this whole process. Um, the more that I watch these, these films that she's hosting, the more that, um, that we bring it to, to light, she is traveling in this pursuit across the country and, and finding local makers and, and showcasing what we would never know elsewhere, right? To see, to see a grain miller, to, to bring farmers together and to, to develop partnerships all within a community. There's lives changing. And one thing that I looked at with Edward Jones is where do we, in tastemakers, what, what's our commonality? And the big thing I saw from it, well, one, we are a national sponsor, so that aside. Uh, but as you start to peel back these layers, you see that we too are focused on developing partnerships within the community. We too are wanting to do what's best for our clients and for those around us. And I think it's amazing just to watch that partnership develop and as I'm learning about these makers, I learn more that Edward Jones is right there with them and what our pursuit is. And so I just thank y'all so much again for being here today. And uh, we got a little video that we're gonna go ahead and take a look at. So thank you. My name is Andrew Streeter. I'm a financial advisor with Edward Jones right here in Vero Beach. I am Pat Patterson. I have an Edward Jones office here in Houston, Texas. My name is Kathleen Morgan. I own Honey Child Sweet Creams in Houston, Texas. I'm Valerie Bing. I'm Alden Bing, and we're co-founders of Wolf Island Brewery. Andrew. Hey, Alden, how are you? Good, welcome. Thanks, Hi, appreciate you having me. Hey. I made it. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How about yourself? Doing all right. So today we'll be walking you through the process from A to Z and how we make beer. And we'll take citrus and we'll amplify the flavors that are already occurring and just take it to another level. What makes this fun is the relationships that we develop with people in the community. They're relying on us to give them a good recommendation of what would match well with what their preferences are. watermelon basil frozen custard. So you're actually going to cook it? Yeah. Well, it has eggs in it. Do you cook a lot at home? Absolutely not. Oh, really? <laughs> Excellence in this job is just as important. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of got started in this when I wanted to be more involved with sustainable foods and really work with what the farmers are able to grow and what they do have versus what I want. We develop a personalized process mm -hmm. for our clients. It's very much like what you're doing here, as you know. I mean, it's just step by step. Yeah. If I know you like ice cream, mm -hmm. then right. <laughs> we've got a starting point, right? right? Okay. It's a very personable business, and that's what we do is we build relationships. And we stick to a process, much like your guys' process. It's really the community feel that I love most about Oregon Island Brewery here. It brings families together. It's all about who we connect with and the relationships that we build. A lot of similarities in our businesses, even though we have a very different finished product. Listening to farmers and producers has really kind of led me to find my place and where I can be impactful as well. To get to know people, to help them develop ways to address those needs. We come up with a personalized strategy for everybody to work with. But the art in that is really in the conversations early on and, and what is this for, what's important to you. Vastly different industries, but there's still a whole lot of commonality in how you work with people and how you relate to people on a human level. There's something special about making something that other people appreciate. You can make a really serious difference in people's lives. We're passionate about doing what we do, so we share that. I like that.
Hello, everybody. I am so thrilled to be back in Austin and particularly here at Jester King Brewing. Um, we were here in June shooting the Barton Springs episode with James, and you guys have an amazing food culture here in the Austin area. So you, I know you celebrate that, but I just want you to know that we're here and really thrilled to be part of it. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of background, I've been in food media for about 20 years, and Tastemakers, we're on our second season. And actually, the folks who you just saw in that video were part of our first season, and Kathleen Morgan um, from uh, Honey Child's in Houston, she's one of the vendors at our Maker's Market, um, which we're gonna be able to enjoy after the show. Um, so what we do, there are 13 episodes in a season, and each episode um, for five days, we're on location with these makers, and it takes a lot of their time and trust to kind of let us come in and tell their story. And um, we did, for example, agricole rum in Hawaii this season. We did kelp farming off the coast of Maine. We did grain here in Austin. So we're out seeking these really unique stories of people who are woven into the fabric of their community communities through food. And um, we all, we, at, at about nine of the locations, we, excuse me, we go back for events. And this is the first of our second season. Uh, but we're going to be going to Phoenix next month and San Francisco the month after. And the idea really is to create those connections because it's not for me as the producer of the show and the host of the show it's not just about telling the story it's about bringing you together with the makers who are covering and, and really kind of squaring the circle so before we get started um, i'm going to show you the intro to the episode so you can kind of get the lay of the land as it were and then we're going to get started and you're going to meet david norman from easy tiger so take a look at this it's the very beginning of the show and then we'll we'll move on <laughs> Rising craft brewing and artisan baking has led to a resurgence in local mills and heritage grains. In this episode of Tastemakers, come along with me to Austin, Texas, and meet a classical musician turned miller who is supplying the area's best brewers, bakers, and distillers with freshly milled local grains. I'm Kat Neville, and for the past two decades, I've been telling the story of local food. In that time, American food culture has exploded in tiny towns and big cities from coast to coast. In Tastemakers, I explore the maker movement and take you along for the journey to meet the makers who define the flavor of American cuisine. Um, what we do with these videos, um, with these events, is we we bring the makers and the chefs and all the people who are part of the episode back up on stage. Um, I kind of like interact with them with these live demos and these live interviews. And so what's really fun about David, who's the head dough puncher at Easy Tiger, he is going to be doing a, uh, a kneading demonstration in, in different stages throughout this event. So you're going to kind of see how the bread develops because that's one of the most intimidating things about baking bread is like, am I going to screw it up? Do I really know how to knead it? and get the results that I'm looking for. So let's check out this quick segment with David and then we'll invite him up on stage. Here at Easy Tiger, head dough puncher David Norman was one of the first folks to use Barton Springs Mill flour in his breads. And David is gonna show us how to make a really dense Danish rye bread. So you start off with the rye flour from Barton Springs, yes, right? Yes, we have the rye flour in here, ground on the stone mill, but I also buy the rye berries, and then we cook them, because if you just put them in the bread, they'd be hard, crack your teeth. So you cook those first, and then this is our rye sour. So this is a sourdough culture that was started and fed only with rye flour. So what does rye taste like? To me, it tastes like the earth. It's okay. very earthy, more so than wheat. How about this oat bread? Let's talk about this, because yeah, this oat is bread. your own invention, right? It is. I developed it as a toasting bread. And so the Barton Springs whole wheat is the base of this, but then you incorporate like uh, actual oatmeal into right. it. Right, we cook the oats into an oatmeal and then add that in at the end of the mix. Oh, wow. You can see little flecks of them, but they've kind of melded into the dough. That smells wonderful. 
How fun. So this bread is our pan au levant. It's a French-style sourdough, and it has a little bit of whole rye in it, only about 3%. But then I add about 20% whole spelt into this, too. That's gorgeous. This is our multigrain. That has whole wheat, whole spelt, and whole rye in it, and then a nine-grain cereal in it as well. Beautiful. And then this is our German-style rye bread. This is just 40% rye, but it has that same rye sour. And because it's a dark whole rye, it still has that beautiful color to it. And that's what's wonderful. I mean, you have spelt, rye, whole wheat, all these different grains that are grown right here in Texas can make completely different types of breads with different flavor profiles. Fun to play with. <laughs> We're lucky to have James in the area and to be able to buy flour from him and also support another local business. And we have this incredible opportunity to try different grains through James, and that's what we're looking for, is different flavors. Yes, the art of baking is fermenting those grains and adding flavor to them, but when you start with full flavor, you end up with so much more. Perfect, all right, David, come up on stage. Everyone, give David a hand. Yay. Hi. Hi. So great to see you again. Oh, it's great to see you too. And I love, so he's actually the only one who's wearing a lav mic, so he's kind of like, he's channeling Madonna up here on stage. I love it. Um, I have to admit, I am intimidated in the bread making process. Uh, you know, I always feel like, oh, I add the yeast, is it warm enough, is it too warm? And you actually just came out with a book um, that really kind of explains to people the process of bread baking. So before we kind of get started, are there any just really great tips that you can offer? Relax, slow down, <laughs> slow down. Slow it's, down? Slow down, stay a while, it's easy tiger. Okay. No, it, it just, <laughs> Relax with it and feel it, because it's about feel. Awesome. All right, so this is going to take a, a few minutes. So let's go ahead and get started, and we'll chat okay. while you're working. So what is your first step? So I have whole wheat flour from Barton Springs and a little bit of spelt, whole spelt flour as well. This, so this is entirely whole grain, the flours here. Uh, and then I have salt. Mm -hmm. And then this is my sourdough starter, my French Levon. So I'm just going to... Mix that in there a little bit. So let's talk about first off. When you say mm -hmm. it's spelt, what does spelt taste like? Ooh. How is it different from Somebody. like a whole wheat? Why do you use it? <sighs> Somebody asked All me that. All the questions. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I can describe rye, but I, I have a hard time describing spelt. But I just know I love that flavor. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know how to say exactly. I didn't know I was going to stump you <laughs> with the first question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's one of my favorite grains for, for flavor. Okay. Um, you can make 100% spelt f uh, bread. Mm -hmm. It does have gluten. It forms gluten, um, but not as much as modern wheat. It's an ancestor of wheat. Uh, so you can't get the really open crumb with spelt. But for me, so I use it as an, an inclusion for flavor. In our Levon, it's what gives us a really full flavor. Interesting. And so, um, rather than adding like live yeast, your like yeast packets or something, you're using this sourdough starter, which yep. is something that people can make at home. It's not terribly difficult to make. No. So, kind of like, can you, you can, go through how to make it? Uh, you just mix together flour and water, and mm -hmm. let it sit around. <laughs> um, <laughs> it so. actually is all you have to do. Um. Uh, <laughs> and then, most of the time, it works. Uh, Are you feeling confident <laughs> um, with your bread baking skills uh, yet? So it's like, most of the time it works, try to relax, <laughs> just sit it over in a corner and right. let it do its thing. No, uh, so there is, there's a lot of yeast everywhere. And, but most of the yeast in a sourdough comes from the grains itself. Because they're the yeast that live on grain. Um, and they're what naturally ferment the grains. Now there's... Um, a lot of people that start their sourdoughs with fruit, with grapes, mm -hmm. but the yeast that's on grapes actually is better at fermenting grape juice than it is at fermenting flour. And I've actually done an experiment where I did the same method with grapes and without, and the one without the grapes took off a lot faster. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. So there is, there's yeast everywhere. And I even know some people who've made sourdough or even like a spontaneously fermented beer like the good folks here at Jester King are famous for mm -hmm. by like sticking their hands in it because you have yeast all over you. Mm -hmm. It's a single-celled organism. Um, and, and it's just this kind of magic that um, it eats up all of the available sugars in whatever it is you want to ferment. And it, and it releases um, like carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. essentially. And so that's how and you alcohol. get all of your like little bubbles and stuff exactly. in the bread. Exactly. And then the other thing that you're doing is you develop the gluten mm -hmm. to capture that carbon dioxide. And that's what lightens the bread, leavens the bread. So gluten is a scary word for a lot of people these days. <laughs> yes. um, and so I think one of the interesting things that I'll probably touch on when we chat with James is the way that his flowers are milled and the fact that he's actually doing full whole grains and we'll get into some details of what is whole grain and what is it not um but you know when you're having something that's made with a a uh, a grain like something that james is producing your body reacts to it differently than something that would be coming from like a standard ap flower off the shelf yeah yeah there's so much goodness left in this yeah <laughs> and then the fact that it's fresh as well so, so t kind of take me through what you're doing here. So I'm doing something that's, it's not a no-need bread, but it's not a 15 minutes like adding flour to your table and stuff. So what I do is I just start out hydrating and squeezing the dough, the flours and you're the like water. You're like massaging it. I am kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'm making it happy. <laughs> so, so you... And the one thing with the whole grains is you can add a lot more water to them. They're very thirsty. And that is kind of a big difference. So if you're used to baking at home with all-purpose flour from the grocery store, that could have been sitting on the shelf for like a year sometimes. But these are freshly milled whole grains, and they do act differently when, when you're baking. So do you have some insight for folks? Um, Keep putting more water in for sure. Okay. Like, How do you then, know when to stop? And then um, don't be scared of it being wet and sticky like this at this stage. So, yes, it's, it's fun to <laughs> squeeze in there, but um, you want to resist the temptation to add more flour at this stage, even though okay. it's really sticky, because we're going to let it develop the gluten. And I can smell. From here, I can actually smell like that yeasty, bready uh -huh. aroma. And you just got started. Right. Yeah. Oh, the, these flowers just smell fantastic, too. So how did you get hooked up with James? You were one of his first clients. <laughs> he walked into the bakery one day and just said, Hi, I'm James Brown, and I'm thinking of starting a stone mill. I was like, Hi. <laughs> how are you? Um, but at the time, we were in... Uh, in the beginning stages of our expansion to our new location. And I was actually thinking of buying a mill and putting it in. I have some friends up in the Northeast that have mills in their bakery. Um, but the advantage up there is they have the grain economy already mm -hmm. somewhat established. Um, one of the bakeries is in Providence, Rhode Island. So they can buy sacks of grain that are local and then mill it themselves. Um, but we don't really, we haven't had that here yeah. in Central Texas. There's a lot of grain grown in Texas, for sure. <laughs> but to just be able to buy uh, sacks of grain, especially heritage grains and full-flavored grains, it, it just didn't exist. Um, so what I knew, so once I started talking to James and realized he was really serious and was doing his all his research, um, what James brings to the picture is not just the great milling. Now, milling obviously is a different profession, a different trade than baking, but I knew that we could learn that part. Um, what, but what's more difficult is everything else that James does in the background. Meeting the farmers, getting them the seed to grow, being there at harvest, Collect, you know, we think of flour as always being there. It's kind of a commodity, right? But it's grown once a year. It's harvested once a year. Now, the great thing about grain is it stores really well. That's one reason why it's been so much of the backbone of civilization. 
but somebody's got to store it. They've got to clean it and store it. And so James is doing that. It's all those relationships and all the background stuff to start to develop this grain economy in Central Texas that James has done so brilliantly in the last three years. Well, and, and how has it changed your baking? Like access to these freshly milled local flours, did it, did it have an impact? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, just the flavors themselves. Yeah. And we were buying good whole grain flour. Um, but this is just a game changer with the flavors. Well, and even with the video, we kind of went through a laundry list of all of these different things that you're working with. And, you know, is that when you're, when, and you, you have a pretty big bakery. So mm -hmm. when you have like new bakers who are coming on board, how do you teach them about these different grains and how to work with them? And um, I was wondering what you're getting out of your pocket. <laughs> It's my dough scraper. <laughs> like, what's in there? Um, you know, so how do you kind of open their eyes to what these grains can do and also how to bake with them properly? It's all just getting in there. Hands on. Doing it every night. There's, uh, we, we have over 20 bakers now. And so I wish there were more time to do it. I do do a little introductory class, and I get their hands in the flour. Um, um, just about baking because what I realized for a long time I was teaching some of the fundamentals of bread to the front of the house staff so that they're knowledgeable about what they're selling and I realized well some of these young people coming in baking especially they come from restaurants or something they want to learn something new they don't necessarily even know some of the fundamentals so I've been trying to teach them that yeah that's a fun part of my job. I would think so. I would think so. It was it was such a an amazing experience to get inside of your kitchen because you know there are all these different bakers making so many different things all at once, and um, and because you guys are doing breads and pastries and the the flours that you're using are different and that's one of the things that I've talked to James about is like for pastry and pizza you're looking for a very a very fine flour mm -hmm. as opposed to something like this where it's a little bit more rustic. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, mm, yes, that is true. Yeah. So tell us what Stretch you're doing. It. So <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> you can see I, I'm just kind of stretching it and folding it over. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where, and I really emphasize this in the book, is this is the part where you want to resist adding more flour. Because that's, you know, in all the home baking books for that I started with, I started with James Beard's book, you know, you, you like adjust the flour. Mm-hmm. Well, what I learned when I started baking professionally was that you really want to adjust the water because that's the true variable. You want the flour and the salt and the whatever yeast to be in the same proportions and then find out how much water the, your particular flour needs. Interesting. Yeah, because not being a confident baker myself, if my dough looked like this, I'd be like, oh, I need to put more flour in it because mm -hmm. it's too sticky and I would be totally wrong. <laughs> And then I would end up with what kind of a heavy loaf. It yeah, wouldn't heavy have the and lightness. Dry and yeah. Not as, yeah. I would have messed nice. it up. So, but the th thing I do is, besides resisting adding flour, is I'm going to let the dough do it, the work for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a little bit of kneading at first. You know, I squeezed everything together, got all the water in there, and now I'm doing a little bit of kneading to get it started. You're doing a lot of kneading, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> this is like but, an upper body workout. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm just going to let it sit and do its own thing. Okay. And I'm going to come back in between people. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're going to have to see me again. Sorry. Um, and I'm going to give it some folds. And what we'll see is the gluten, like right now I can tear it really easily so that it's coming together, but the gluten isn't developed yet. Okay. But over time, just by resting it and then folding it a little bit, we'll see it develop the gluten and be less sticky and actually have some structure to it. Cool. So. That's going to be fun. It's a fun so, process. Yeah. So after each one of the makers comes up, he's going to, uh, Dave is going to come back up and kind of like do some more folding. So we'll be able to see all of this develop. And um, Easy Tiger is going to have a booth out at the maker's market. So you'll be able to chat him up and yeah. also take a look at his book as yeah. well. The book's there. And we also, this is kind of fun. We have some sourdough kits. So we have a little portion of sourdough and a little booklet on how to feed it and maintain it and bake with it. So. Awesome. That's a new thing for us. So yeah, that's cool. About that. I'll probably get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll see, see you in just in a, a little minutes. bit. All right. Give it up for David, head dough puncher. 
Oh, oh God. Okay, now I've got dough on me. Because I'm, okay, well, that's okay. Get a little dirty. Actually, there's some on the mic too. So James, you're going to get dirty. Hold on. There we go. All right. Next up, you're going to meet the man himself, the man of the hour, James Brown. But first, I want you to take a look at this quick video, and then we're going to bring him up on stage. Barton Springs Mill is what is known as a grain hub. James brings in grain from a range of local farmers and then mills and distributes to local bakers, brewers, and distillers. It's this type of regional connectedness that we lost with the industrialization of food. The grain industry was one of the things that was really destroyed with the centralization of bread and flour production and also monocropping in these large-scale farms that make wheat and rye and corn. There's a lot more tied to it, too, in terms of health and digestibility in grains. People are wanting to return to many of the older varieties, not only because they have great flavor, but because of nutritive value and also the fact that they know how their body will behave uh, in terms of uh, consuming these grains. Many people are suffering from inflammatory responses from uh, conventionally raised grain. So knowing where their grain comes from and how it's been treated from the time it was planted until the time it goes into flour in a bag is super important. We do have these modern varieties of wheat that are bred for disease resistance, pest resistance, high yield drought resistance with flavor, baking performance, nutrition being further down the line in terms of uh, priority. And uh, when we return to these ancient varieties, there's more flavor. Potentially there's better uh, nutrition, particularly in whole grains. We're working with farmers who are farming organically, so there's no pesticides, herbicides, or any other chemicals used during the process of raising these grains. Once they go from there, they come straight here to our mill, so they pass uh, any grain elevators where storicides may be sprayed on them. Usually also in the milling process, they will blend multiple types of wheat together and also add dough enhancers. It'll be fortified with chemical uh, vitamins, could possibly be bromated. And even when they make whole wheat, a lot of it ultimately is not 100% whole grain. It's just the bran and endosperm leaving the germ out. So there's quite a bit to it that's different. And the root is far more circuitous than it is here, which is straight from the farm to our door. All right, let's welcome James to the stage. Come on up. So good to see you. It's good to see you. Oh my gosh. So um, when I learned about James Brown, I was immediately drawn to the story because as we've kind of alluded to, you know, there used to be what is called a grain economy. There used to be mills all over the country where people would bring in whatever grain that they had grown mostly themselves and have it milled on site and take it on home. And the miller would be paid in, you know, a little bit of that leftover flour, but all of that went away in the mid-century. And, you know, so what gave you the confidence to say, I'm going to bring this back right here in Austin, Texas? Yeah, I'm not sure I ever had the confidence necessarily, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was baking at home. Um, I have some culinary background and I was baking at home. I got bitten by the, the home baking bug. There was this real movement, this return to sourdough uh, baking by the likes of Tartine and Josie Baker Bread and some of these folks in, in uh, the California. They were going back to gra good grains long fermented, which there are some health benefits and obviously flavor benefits there. And I couldn't find the kind of grain that I wanted to make a flavorful loaf of bread. And so I'm not known for doing things by half measure. <laughs> uh, so, but I found that there wasn't a source and that there was a real opportunity there to make an impact in the, in the culinary field and with, and with food. So I think that you need to explain to people the volume of what it is that you're doing. So when we were here shooting in June, your location was at Frog Pond Lane? Is that mm -hmm. the street it was on? Yep, 290 in Frog Pond Lane. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, and that I thought was a pretty decent size uh, facility. You could see pictures of it when I was walking through. But now you're actually, you have two and a half acres on the same property essentially as Treaty Oak Distilling, just right down the road. And you have grown, what, tenfold? Do you think that your space is about maybe 10 times larger? Yeah, well, our, our, our previous place was 5,000 square feet. The new one is 18,000 square feet. It'll hold about 400 tons of grain inside the building. Yes. So, 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> what I think is amazing is that what you're offering people is so special, but you're, the volume of what you're doing is on par with somebody who might be doing things in a less thoughtful way. So, I mean, how do you find your network of farmers, and and to what do you just you know con, what do you contribute that success of of translating the quality and the importance of what you're doing to those chefs, to the you know the brewers, to the distillers. You know, one of my primary concerns in getting started was scalability. I mean, it's very easy to get caught up in uh, the rush of new business and the rush in demand and then, then to let quality slip or standards slip. And so we've been very deliberate and careful about rolling out our production into different markets, including for consumers, but also wholesale and just doing it in baby steps. Yeah. And that's helped us keep the quality high. Uh, farmers, we have plenty of farmers with plenty of acreage, and so then now it's about caring for the land, growing it in a reasonable, responsible, sustainable way, and then fa paying farmers a fair wage. Um, generally speaking, farmers have not been paid more for grain since the 1920s or 30s. We're still paying them the same price. Uh, for grain today that they were making in the 20s and 30s. Which is so, shocking, because it's all in the commodity market. That's right. Yeah. So one of our first priorities was to pay the farmer a fair wage for the job that they're doing. And then to try to alleviate some of the responsibilities that uh, Big Ag was placing on them for storage, cleaning, processing. Take all As the value-add entity, take all those things away and let us be responsible for those and let the farmers farm. So they can focus on creating a great raw product. That's right. So you actually brought some stuff with you um, mm -hmm. because I think that that's also another um, thing that I find so exciting about how you've been so embraced by the culinary community because what you're offering them is not typical. It's not standard issue. It's something where, you know, it's, uh, they have to kind of play around with recipes and figure out what these flavors are, which is exciting to a certain, you know, type of baker like David or, um, or chef like Mark, who you're going to be meeting next. Uh, so kind of take us through what these are. So we have some wheat, whole red, uh, hard red winter wheat berries here. Um, then here we've got, uh, some varieties of corn. And I really got into the business to do wheat and rye because I was a huge breadhead and that interested me a lot and then people started asking me about corn brewers and distillers but also bakers and I've just been totally taken by the genetic diversity of, of corn uh, the different colors the different flavors and aromas here we have a bloody butcher red corn here at the top uh, there's a have great names too <laughs> Hopi, uh, Hopi blue corn is a huge part of an indigenous people's spiritual practice, uh, and corn breeding is integral to that. And so this is uh, one that was originally developed by the Hopi Nation. We have uh, a Oaxacan green corn down here that in, is still used to make green masa, makes green tortillas and uh, uh, green masa. And uh, one of the things that's really exciting about working with David and working with the folks at Sour Duck, Mark in particular, is they're making really robust foods with really robust flavors. And hitherto, we used to call it, say it this way, bread was a delivery system. You need a way to shovel this stuff into your mouth, and you need to be able to put it on something. And it was largely neutral in flavor. And now we have this, this array or palette of colors or, or spice cabinet in these grains that are robust enough and, and, and rich in flavor that holds up to you know, pickled vegetables and cured meats and all of these things. It's really a player now. And it's can, exciting for chefs to work with that. So can you explain some of these flavors? Like the spelt that, that we were talking about before, and Dave's like, I can't really put my finger on how to describe it. Because, I mean, it's like you think of, okay, I think I know what whole wheat tastes like, you know, but what does Rouge de Bordeaux taste like? And, you know, the red fife that you mentioned. I mean, wheat is not one thing. It's so many different things. Yeah, the Rouge is, is, a, is a key example of what can happen uh, with with a good wheat variety that's that's been forgotten, mixed with superior farming. Uh, Cameron Kep, who's yes, he's here, here today, he, I'm, I'm going to have him come up here. Introduce him around today. Make sure that you get to meet him. He grows Rouge de Bordeaux for us, just outside of New Braunfels, Texas. Uh, this Rouge de Bordeaux was a 19th century French bread wheat, um, and it naturally has these flavors and aromas of molasses, baking spices, and cinnamon. 
Uh, David can tell you he's, you know, he's made brioche from that and people swear that he's put these sweeteners and spices in the bread wow. and it's just the expression of the grain. And I've, I've never been one to get too high on myself or feel too self-important, so I've been very hesitant to use the word terroir when I talk about grain. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, every one of these grains we've grown in at least two locations to see where they're going to grow best, where they're going to behave best. Uh, Cameron Kep has heavy clay soil, very much like what the French were growing the sweet on in the 19th century, in the 1860s. And there it expresses all those flavors and characteristics I described. We also grew it in La Misa, or in Tokyo, Texas, in the Panhandle, which is sandy loam. And it was about as uninteresting a flavor profile and aroma profile as you could get. That's fascinating. So the, the, the area, the time, the place, soil chemistry, superior farming, all p play into the end product. So Well, and... So at your new mill, which, by the way, uh, there's going to be... So Abby Jane is an amazing baker, and she... Uh, last night, we, we had a kind of a, a small event there, and there's a wood-burning oven, and she is pulling out these amazing pizzas, and in April, she's going to be opening up a full-service um, bakery and pizza kitchen right there um, on site with Barton Springs Mill. So you can go into the mill, you can tour, you can eat food that's made with these flowers that are milled right there on site and you can watch the milling process while it's happening. I mean, it's really something that immerses people in how their food is made, which is not something that most people have the opportunity to experience these days. One of the things that I really dreamt about doing is making this sort of hyper-transparent process. So uh, even in the early days at the old place, we had observation windows into the mill room. People could come in at any time and see us milling. And uh, in the early days, it was a little interesting when the, when the wheels come off the cart and something blows up and goes totally wrong. You turn around, there's somebody looking in the window. <laughs> uh, we've had to get used to that because there's people watching all the time. But, you know, that's, that's a great thing, too. Um, but the dream, which I think we'll see come to fruition in the next two years fully, is that in 100 paces, you'll be able to have beer, distilled spirits, pastries, bread, pizza, seeing mill flour being milled, seeing grain being malted. You'll be able to see everything that can be done with grain being done in one place. And that's, it's, I think it'll be amazing. I do too. I can't wait. I know. We'll have to come back and do another one of these events. I love it. Okay. So James is going to be sticking around for the rest of the day, and he also has a market booth where you are going to be able to access um, a lot of his flowers. What did you bring with you? I think we've got a little bit of everything. Okay, you know, good. We have eight different hard red winter wheat varieties and all sorts of corn and uh, pastry flowers, everything. And your grits are amazing. Oh, so he you. also turns these varieties of corn into grits, and I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah, you have to get your hands on these grits because... They're good. <laughs> you hear it like, you're just like, yeah, I want some grits. <laughs> so I'm not going to get away without saying this yes. to you. Um, this experience, uh, one thing about makers is that they are very passionate about what they do. Uh, we have our heads down. We're just trying to make a difference and we're trying to move, move the ball forward. Um, not all of us are made for television <laughs> and, and are as articulate about telling our, star, our story as perhaps we should be. You and your team have been amazing in telling our story. Thank You're you. a consummate storyteller. Oh, thank you. And your you. staff's amazing. It's, it's a privilege of a lifetime. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Thank you. Oh, I'm taking your mic. Okay, now I've got goosebumps. Thank you, James. And actually, I do want to mention, when you look at this, all this gorgeous video, so Chris and Jeff are actually here. They are my intrepid and very patient crew. And literally, I mentioned to you at the beginning of the show, we're on location for five days. So these guys and I, we have 13 episodes, do the math. That's like three months out of the year that we are on location together. And we love each other and it's a great, it's great chemistry, but they're here. So I'll make sure I see you guys back in the back. Can you guys wave? There's the guys, they're the best. <laughs> they make everybody look good. And then Jared is our editor. He's not here. He's the one um, who really edits everything together. Okay, so David, you want to come up and do your folds? And then we're going to welcome Mark up on stage um, for a little cooking demo. For the guy, uh, Mark from Sour Duck. Go ahead. Great. So um, now we're just going to 
take this dough. See, already it's stretchier. It's not breaking as quickly. So we're just going to scrape it up a little bit. That's amazing. And so it's only been like 10 minutes. And the gluten is, is forming itself. And now we just have to kind of help it organize itself into a better network. So we just fold it over like that. Wow. Fold it like that. So you don't have to do like this 15 minutes of backbreaking kneading. This is why I've obviously been doing this wrong the entire time I've tried to bake. Well, it took me years to figure this out too. But this, <laughs> but it's not. This is not my technique. This is nothing I invented. This is what bakers used to do when they had big batches of dough to work by hand before they had a machine to do it. Wow. So they let the bread do its to help with the work. So just do that and then stretch it over like that. Wow. And, and now we're this is rest gorgeous, it again. by the way. Where did you get this uh, dough? Tr is it a dough trough? What do you yeah, call it? Yeah, it's a dough, dough trough. My yeah. wife bought it for me in Castorville, Texas. Well, it's beautiful. So, How old years is it? Ago. Oh, from the uh, late 19th century. Yeah, I, think. I would yeah. think so. Yeah. That's gorgeous. From Eastern Europe. So, yeah, cool. it's fun. Trusty thing. Okay, is that it? Yeah, that's right. it for now. We'll see you can in I just say a little one bit. More real yes, quick of course thing? you can. So um, I talked about James and our business relationship, but I wanted to also mention that James is just a wonderful person, and we've really I count him as a good friend now too. Oh, so. yay! We love James. <laughs> okay, so. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Odd Duck and Sour Duck in Austin. Yes, we love them. Um, so we're going to take a, a look at a quick video, and then Mark is going to come up on stage. And he has a really fun demo with wheat berries. You're going to be really surprised what he's able to do with these. So let's take a look at this first. Modern grain varieties have been bred for drought resistance and high yield, but the heritage grains that James mills at Barton Springs are focused on flavor. That's exactly why the folks here at Sour Duck use almost everything that James produces. So let's head inside and check it out. As a baker, you make your decisions on flour based on performance and flavor. So. Each of the different types of flour that James carries have a little bit of different baking qualities. All of the sourdough bread that we do here is produced with 100% of the pre-fermented flour, so actually the sourdough flour. It comes from Barton Springs Mill. The brownie that we make here at Sour Duck features the Abruzzi rye flour, as well as a little bit of Rouge de Bordeaux. We were looking to produce a brownie that had flavors that complemented deep chocolate and cocoa powder and also highlighted some of the olive oil. The fruit kolache that we make here features a little bit of sourdough starter in it and then we have the Rouge de Bordeaux flour for its spice notes. The pastry cream that we use on top of that fruit kolache is going to feature some of the mesquite powder that's hammer milled out at Barton Springs Mill along with whatever Texas fruit is seasonal and available. The chocolate chip cookie that we make here at the bakery features the Sonora 65% sifted flour. It's a little bit more whole wheat flour, so while it's not the number one concern when you're eating a chocolate chip cookie, it is a little bit healthier than your average chocolate chip cookie. The launch of Barton Springs Mill, in my opinion, has been the single most significant thing happening to the Austin food scene in the last 10 years. In terms of other businesses that are opening, other restaurants that are opening, or food trends, it seemed like the thing that impacted or pushed the food scene in Austin the furthest down the road of progression. Awesome. All right. Mark, come on up upstairs. Come up on stage. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. So I'm actually going to give you this mic. Are you going to be able to maneuver both? I think we can do both. I'm okay. just trying not to start an oil fire. That is good. Yes. Yeah, Let's forgot, avoid I fires. Oil, I forgot the oil up here before, and my business partner's like, you should probably go check on that oil. And I checked my <laughs> thermometer, and it's at 418 degrees. Oh. Uh, maybe I better turn it down. How are we doing now? So we, I dropped it down too far now, so... <laughs> I guess we got well, then we can chit chat. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so we, you know, you were making healthy chocolate chip cookies oh, yeah. out of wonderful flowers. But seriously, like on a pastry side, like you're thinking about savory things like breads, but on the pastry side with cookies and those brownies, which look amazing, um, you know, how do these really deeply flavored and um, whole grains, how do they impact pastry? 
Well, they, I mean, they, they impact pastry and they sort of reset the standard or your expect your base expectation on like what a sugar cookie can taste like or what a brownie can taste like and how it can have depth and nuance and not just be about like uh, sweetness and fat and unctuousness. Now, yeah. it, now there's like some interesting mineralities going on and it also provides like a moving target that makes uh, baking like super interesting and worth spending a whole career on because it's like every bag of flour is a little bit different and you get to relearn what's going on and uh, experience what we've experienced in terms of how vegetables have tasted like they're from the place that they're grown and see how that impacts uh, the, you know, the dry part of the larder. So all the dry goods and uh, how they get a, you can taste the nuance there. So when you started baking, I'm sure you started you know, with like standard issue, all purpose flour. So when were you introduced to these type of grains? Was it through James? It was, it was definitely through James. There was one other farmer that was kind of toying with growing some wheat on his farm. And that's actually the, the main pork provider that we use at Richardson Farms. Oh, cool. And um, he just didn't have quite the knowledge base or couldn't, he had so much going on that it needed somebody with like a just dedicated focus and sort of a, you know, unending hunger towards like figuring the grain thing out. Um, and that's where James took over. Well, and so how do you decide I'm going to use the Sonoran wheat in this cookie or I'm going to use the spelt or the whatever? Do you just kind of experiment and, and play? Well, part of it's experimentation. Part of it's the categories of flour in terms of if you talk of, of hard wheats versus soft wheats, red wheats versus white wheats, and then winter versus summer wheats. Um, and a, a big part of it is uh, being able to pick up the phone or shoot James a text and be like, hey, what's going on with X, Y, or Z flour? If the Rouge de Bordeaux, um, is it strong enough for what we're looking for? Or is the, is the TAM the way to go? Or uh, if you don't have enough red fife, what can you send me? And he'll have all that, all that information uh, on the tip of his tongue. It's amazing because he's a baker too, and that's how he got into this. Is that you know he was in he was a breadhead as he said, and so he really is able to kind of like collaborate with you to make sure you get the best results. Absolutely, and one of the one of the things that I'm trying to recommend to everybody that we work with at Sour Duck and Odd Duck that's handling these grains is to get out to the mill to visit James to see how this stuff um, you know goes from the raw seed into the finished flour and. Um, that's honestly where a lot of the, a lot of the hints into what the best applications for these flowers would come. I went out and cleaned a bunch of uh, Sonora with James one day a couple of years back, and it smelled like honey graham. And I was like, oh, that would be killer in a ton of the following applications. That just immediately like where that note would make your pie crust a little bit more interesting. It would make um, just a basic sugar cookie into something special and thought provoking. That's so cool. You mentioned the seed cleaning. So if you actually, if you go to our website, wearetastemakers.com, you can actually stream the entire episode there. And I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show, we are nationally on public television stations. So you can find us on PBS. We reach over 90% of American television households. But, um, the, in that episode, you will be able to see that seed cleaner in action. It is the coolest thing. It was built in the 1930s, and it is made out of wood. And when you see the way that James brings in um, these grains and then essentially like winnows the grain and allows it to fall, it's, the, it's like mesmerizing to see the process of how all of this is done. Yeah. Mesmerizing is the perfect word for that machine because it's... I mean, James could explain it very well, but you'll be able to see it on the episode. And uh, when you look at the machine and it's in its sort of uh, base build, you're like, this is definitely not OSHA approved, definitely not safe. <laughs> uh, and he, he did add some aftermarket parts to make it a little bit more user friendly, <laughs> but it's still an intimidating thing to see. Mm -hmm. um, it's huge. It's huge. And the level of... Uh, engineering will kind of blow your mind to be like in the 1930s this machine was state of the art and there's not a whole and it lot still is. that's that much better now yeah. which is so cool I know it is how are we on temp uh, we've got about 100 degrees to go we're okay, most we're, of the way there this is what we call in media it's like we're going to stretch we're going to stretch well, we can talk about the wheat berry that, uh, that we're going to feature so the first wheat berry that I saw being cleaned out at Barton Springs Mills was at Sonora it's called white Sonora Super interesting grain because it goes back to the 1640s in North America. So if you've ever if you've ever gone to church and had communion bread, the very first communion bread to ever be made in the United States or North America was from white Sonoran flour. 
Um, Can I interject with a story? Absolutely. So um, I mentioned that we kind of travel all over. Our next event is in Phoenix. We did an episode on the Gila River Indian community, which is just outside of the city of Phoenix. And we focused in on this um, Akimel Odom uh, family that are bringing back these heritage um, you know, varieties of corn and the tepary bean, but then also these varieties of wheat. And it was Father Padre Kino who came through and... And he was this back in the 17th century, and he is the one who introduced the Sonoran wheat that they are cultivating too. And so that's it's interesting that that thread of story of you know of truly the um, you know the, the the Spanish kind of coming through, and they they left these seeds along the way. I'm glad you remembered his name because I was like trying to <laughs> grasp for threads on like what is what's the guy's name? What's the guy's name? So the other interesting character to come into the the story of white Sonora, Sonora is Norman Borlaug, who won a um, Nobel Prize for kind of helping feed the hungry, and used white Sonora as the base grain to make it possible to turn the grain economy of Mexico from having famine and to, to feast to the point where they were exporting. Wow. And he took those lessons that he learned from that grain and went to Pakistan and India and, and is credited with saving, you know, some say up to a billion lives from hunger wow. on the shoulders of the white Sonoran wheat. He did hybridize it, but we've kind of made it through a bridge solution and finding some of the advantages to hybridization and have come back to our roots. And that's what, you know, James and his impact on the area is all about is coming back to the roots and finding out what was so special about that grain from the get-go. And I really wanted to celebrate it today. And that's why we tried to use it in three different forms on that pita. If you had the pita with uh, carrots, yogurt. So the three forms that we had Sonora on there was white Sonora and wheat at 65% sifted. So meaning like 65% of the weight of the grain start weight makes it all the way through the sifter. Um, so that was number one, was it was that flour in the pita. Number two was we made a tabbouli out of, or a wheat berry salad, out of some cooked Sonora berries. And the third one was we nixtamalized or used an alkaline solution like, it, like you would to make corn into a corn tortilla to cook the berries. And then we fried them into what, what's effectively like a corn nut. But it's like a little thinner husk, a little more light of a texture. Um, and then we toss those in... Um, in brewer's yeast or, or in nutritional yeast is what it's called. So we're calling them bread nuts because it's like bread but inside out. So yeast on the outside and then the wheat in the middle. That's so cool. And that's actually what you're going to show us how to make. Exactly. Yeah. And I love that. And so you mentioned wheat berries. And I've actually had a couple of people say, what do you mean wheat berry? But so a grain is a seed. It is the seed of a grass, and the grass can be wheat, it can be spelt, it can be rye, but that's like that seed head that you see at the top, Those are and those little individual grains are called the berries. Mm -hmm. So that's all that is. So um, I'm going to show you like the, the different stages of the wheat berry and the, the, the way that the wheat berry makes it through this process, and it goes from wheat berry to bread nut. Um, I, I do have like a really detailed and version of this video that will that will get with uh, tastemakers and get a, a version of it either posted or linked mm -hmm. to them, so you can get all the measurements and um, um, just different spice mixes out, so you can make it at home. So the three stages of wheat berries that we're gonna do are we have the base cleaned white Sonoran wheat berry. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave some of these up here so you, if, if anybody wants to take a look at them a little bit closer to that, basically all I do with that to start it out is I dump these guys out on a tray and James usually does such a good job or that crew does such a good job of cleaning the wheat that there's not a whole lot of stuff to pick out. But uh, I, I look just in case there are anything, there's anything that might have gotten missed in the seed cleaning process. And then we take those cleaned wheat berries and then we boil them with uh, pickling lime. So like pickling lime, like you can get at, you know, Call or Callahan's has it, or any place that has sort of traditional cooking ingredients, or you can get it on Amazon like everybody else does. What, is that, what does that do? Does it make so the outside soft? It makes the outside soft. It dissolves what's called the pericarb. So you're cooking in an alkaline solution rather than an acid solution. And that's super important because when you dissolve the exterior, especially like when we're talking corn, then you can uh, actually have bioavailable niacin in the corn. So the, throughout uh, you know, the early 1900s in the American South, when we were having issues with 
um, pellagra, which is a disease that involves blindness, that's uh, deficiency in vitamin A through not having bioavailable niacin. They started nixtamalizing corn because they realized that other populations having an exclusively corn diet weren't getting this disease. So that nixtamalization process saved a whole bunch of people's vision in the American South. And um, it also made for a pretty delicious product. So uh, just the nature of being an experimental kitchen, we've uh, been playing with what else can be nixtamalized. And uh, wheat berries and a Sonora berry especially ended up being one of the most interesting ones. So you get that like uh, corn tortilla aroma, um, but a much lighter texture. So That's really cool. Yeah. That's really neat. And we're calling it, we're, we're within... 10 degrees here. Okay. So you got 10 degrees worth of conversation yes. for of me? Yes, chit chat? I yeah. definitely do. <laughs> so, I mean, so tell everybody, have you guys all been to Sour Duck? You, probably. You're all pretty familiar. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Sorry, how about Odd Duck? Who's been to Odd Duck? That's the one that everybody yes. to. Yeah, right? All right, good. Yeah. So, I um, mean, kind of, um, kind of tell me, like, throughout this experimentation with these different flowers, do you have any favorites that you really enjoy working with? I mean, clearly you're passionate about the Sonora, but are there some others that you just are like, if I, because obviously these folks are, have access now to James's flowers as well to play with at home. So if they want to make some healthy chocolate chip cookies or brownies, mm -hmm. what should they be picking up? Uh, I mean, he, he does do an AP that's a mixture of, I, he has two different versions of the AP, if I'm not mistaken, that's Sonora and Tam, and then he has uh, a, a Sonora and Rouge de Bordeaux, it's like the the high shelf, the like, that's the one I want, you know, if you drive a fancy car, that's the one that you should buy. <laughs> um, but my favorite, my favorite in terms of just like bold flavor and like baking performance is Rouge de, Rouge de Bordeaux, and that's like pretty much everybody's favorite, it's kind of hard to argue with. That's like cinnamon toast crunch awesome. when you just smell the wheat berry. So I'm gonna, while we have a couple more seconds, I'm gonna interject one more thing. Cameron, where are you? Raise your hand for me. So Cameron, back here, is actually the farmer featured in the episode, and he grows that Rouge de Bordeaux that James was talking about that had that terroir, the term that he didn't want to use. Um, but truly, so you'll have a chance to meet Cameron. He's, I'm not going to make him come up on stage. I kind of threatened him with that last night when we got together, but I won't, I won't torture you. Um, but in, in the episode, you really get a chance to hear from him and, and learn about his passion for growing growing this incredible wheat variety and just how much he loves the work that he does and, and his family. So that's Cameron back there. He's integral. Without him, yeah. you don't have this. No, no farms, no food. That's right. Okay. How are we doing? I, th I think we're close enough. We're, okay. <laughs> we're hor horseshoes and hand grenades, as my old man used okay. to say. <laughs> um, so basically, after we've got these, these wheat berries that we've put in water and added our pickling lime, and gotten them to be totally tender. And I like kind of do a bite test, bite, bite the berry in half and then look at it. And I don't want to see any chalky white on the interior. It should look fully gelatinized is what we, what we call it in uh, science -y kitchen terms. Um, but if you bite through it, it should be totally tender, just like rice. When you, when you bite through a grain of rice that's properly cooked, it's the same color the whole way through. It's not tacky on the outside. And then we just drain those off and rest them once we get to that point. Resting just meaning let them come to room temp. It's a fancy cooking word again. Um, if, in the meantime, I'll, you heat up your oil and you burn conversation time with the TV host, um, and you get your oil up to 400 degrees, because what we're trying to do is we're taking the remaining moisture, residual moisture that's inside of that wheat berry, and we want it to like very violently, very suddenly um, ex escape via steam, and that kind of puffs the grain a little bit and makes the texture very light. So if you ever had any like cereal grains that are like, uh, puffed, or if you've eaten pretty much any General Mills breakfast cereal, you've had a puffed grain before. So we're puffing the grains with hot oil in fully gelatinized starch. Cool. And uh, we're going to do that. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Do we have overhead camera? No, oh, yeah. no. So imagine it. And uh, when the... <laughs> When the oil boils over and, and melts the polyester uh, um, <laughs> tablecloth, you'll, you'll, you'll know that was that was the moisture escaping faster than I anticipated. <laughs> so I won't I won't do them all, but you'll be you'll be able to hear it. And it doesn't take very long once they're in the oil. It, oh yeah, so it's really it's like it's, it's bubbling it's up. I've, I've Just put, trust us. I put an inch and a half of oil in this, and you can see how hard it's how hard it's smoking and ripping. But there we go. Snap, crackle, pop. 
and once they're once they're in the oil, I'm going to wait for uh, all I'm going to wait for is for the bubbles to subside, which tells me that the moisture is gone, right? Because no more steam is trying to push out and escape. Cool. And when that moisture is all gone, I'm going to use my handy dandy little strainer. I'm going to scoop them out. They're going to drain for a couple seconds, and then they're going to get tossed in that spice. We use nutritional yeast. Uh, and then we, we have what we call nacho spice, which is just basically cumin, coriander, sweet paprika. And that nutritional yeast gives like a cheesiness. Uh, they call it hippie dust in some places. <laughs> it's not like the hippie dust everyone's thinking about right now. But, um, what's cool is when you, when you put the berries in, you can actually see them rupture. And, and so instead of the original shape and size, you're about two times to three times the volume based on whatever you're puffing. So we've got maybe. Should we stretch again? We got we got stretch time. We're gonna call <laughs> 45 seconds to right. one minute stretch time. But it smells super nutty. Yeah, it's like yeah, exactly. It's really cool. It's like that corn tortilla smell. Yeah, definitely. The so the nixtamalization is that is that something that someone can easily do at home? It's way easier than the words is to pronounce. That's good because it, that's it is a mouthful. But so you, it's the pickling lime is what you yep. said, and you just mix it with water and whatever it is that you want to nixtamalize. You got it. So um, we make corn tortillas at um, at Odd Duck and at Barley Swine using the same process and using. If you were at the event last night, who was at the event last night? Yeah. So the the tostada that we made was with Oaxacan green corn that was went through the same process. We nixtamalize it, so it's just water and cow, and that's uh, the cow is the calcium oxide or pickling lime that we're talking about, just whisked into the water. And then we cook it until it's about halfway cooked with corn for corn tortillas. And then we let it rest in that liquid overnight, rinse it, grind it, add a little salt, a little fat, and um, then those get made into a ball and pressed into a tortilla. So that's how we do our corn tortillas. And awesome. the tostada was that, plus cook on a griddle and fry. And it was green. It was green, yeah. the green corn. It's Oaxaca so fun. Green corn. I know, and that's the one, if you um, have a chance to come up and take a look, it's this bottom one. And it says, we call it green, but it's like a rainbow. Um, when, you, when you take a look at these, uh, these kernels of corn, it's like they're green and blue. They're gorgeous. So let's take a look at that. And obviously, you can, you can actually pick some up from James today. So The grits. Um, burn me 10 seconds. I left my spices off camera. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so the spices uh, that he's going to go pick up, obviously this is something else that you can really play with because these are, these are just kind of like toasty little, um, you know, puffed wheat. And, you know, you can mix in any combo. You, could you even make them sweet if you wanted to? We have done that in the past. Yeah. Sort of like uh, candy corn or kettle corn that everybody's into. Um, and that, that can be done by, and if you want them like really candy coating, actually we used to do one with sorghum where we did uh, isomalt, which is like a less sweet sugar, but that's really crunchy, and then um, espalette pepper. And then, oh, we would, then, then we would dry that out so it was like spicy, sweet, crunchy, toasty, which is a fun combo. So I, we're at the point where we can remove these guys from the oil. There's okay. no more bubbles. They're just kind of bobbing around in there, chilled out, and they've settled down. I love and, this. Uh, Both you and David are like, well, you know, you need to take your time. It's chilled out. <laughs> well, I think most of the time in the kitchen, most people just get in their own way more than, uh, that's where most of the mistakes come from, in my opinion. So I would agree. We've got uh, these guys drained off a little bit. Okay. And then we'll need a little a mic help when I, uh, Yes. they will make a, a great sound when I toss them. Uh so you can tell that they're crispy when they make that noise in the, in the bowl. And then you just hit them with whatever your preferred seasoning mix is. We do sea salt, fine sea salt, because it sticks a lot better than kosher salt does. Can I help you? You're yeah. good. Now I have two mics. Yeah. OK. Um, nutritional yeast, that's and that hippie dust. Where does one find nutritional yeast? Nutritional yeast, that's like any health food store. So if you go to the co-op, you go to Whole Foods, Bob's Red Mill is an excellent uh, source for some of those like specialty grain ingredients. And that's another Amazon. Just hit it on Amazon if you can't find it elsewhere. They seem to have everything. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, and then this is, the, this is the nacho spice. And we just toss it in that. And that's pretty much what you had on top of the, um, toast, or on top of the pita today. Awesome. Gorgeous. Mark, Corn nuts. thank you. You're welcome. That was great. Super fun.
Thank you. And again, we will have um, the video up on our site. Um, the good folks from Sour Duck are going to share that with us, so we'll be able to make sure that you have that step-by-step, -step, and you can do that at home. It's such a healthier alternative to any other kind of like little snacky thing, so that's cool. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Yay. Give it up for Mark. Okay. We have one more fold from our friend David, and then it is going to be time for a drink, and then we will release all of you to go and enjoy the Maker's Market. All right, come on up, David. That was fantastic. I know. Great job, Mark. This is, this, this is that fun part, the community part. Yeah, exactly. Learning from each other and getting together like that. That's why we do it's these great. events, because it, it brings everything to life. But it's, look at that, it has really changed. Right, so you can see, now we have, Wow. and normally I would do this two more times, um, but you can already see that we have good de uh, developing gluten here. Gluten is a network of proteins in flour. So when you add water and you add some, mix them mechanically, they link up and make that network, which is what traps the gases from the yeast. Well, and so that's also one of the reasons why it's really difficult to find a really good gluten-free flour because you won't typically get that beautiful result. So, I mean, because gluten, I mean, it's, it's really key to building that structure in a, in a beautiful loaf of bread. It's pretty magical. It's magical. Wow, look at that. I mean, it's like elastic at this point. <laughs> So uh, the process of my kneading process takes about an hour total, but it's not an hour of active time. So you can, you know, do the dishes or read a book or you know. <laughs> so, make some, uh, some um, wheat berry corn nuts. But after that initial part, yeah, you just let it rest for about 15 minutes in between and then do that fold and you do it four times and, and you have a beautifully developed Dough. And does it need to be at a certain temperature? Because it's pretty cool here, but the yeast is still doing its thing. Yeah. Because, I mean, normally in a lot of these recipes, it's like, make sure you put it in a warm mm -hmm. spot, baby your dough. So actually, during this kneading process, we're not really too concerned about the, the fermentation yet. Okay. That happens after you do the first hour. And so then, so okay, so then after the first hour, then what do you do? Then you let it ferment. For, for how long? Uh, my method, I usually do about two hours, okay. maybe three. So you just kind of sit it and let it do its yeah, thing. Yeah, at, at a nice room temperature. But you could also put it in the refrigerator and let it go overnight. You can play around with that part. Okay. Great. You heard so. it from the man himself. <laughs> All right. Thank right. you, David. Thank and again, you. we thank have the, um, the book and everything. Everybody can kind of chat you up at the Maker's sure. Market. You're yes. going to be around? Yes. All well, right. Promise. You can pick his brain. <laughs> awesome. All right. thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Beautiful. Okay, last up, we are going to hear from our good friends at Treaty Oak Distilling, which is right down the road, and I'm going to brag for one second before we see the, the video with, um, with Daniel. Um, they actually won a Good Food Award just a couple of weeks ago, I think it is. Is it two weeks ago? Yeah, Friday, not even two weeks. And so their Ghost Hill bourbon, which is made with the grains from James, is what won that Good Food Award this year. So that's pretty amazing. Absolutely. So they're doing great stuff. Um, yes, give it up for Treaty Oak. Yay. <laughs> so we're going to see this quick video, and then we're going to show you how to make a perfect old-fashioned. Barton Springs Mill supplies Treaty Oak Distilling with about 1.7 million pounds of grain every year. The partnership has grown to the point where James is actually building a new expanded facility here on site. So I'm standing inside of the distillery here at Treaty Oak with Daniel. So explain to me the evolution of Treaty Oak, because you have a restaurant, you have a cocktail lab, there's so much going on here. We're all about the innovative pursuit of the curious. And so to us, you know, there's a lot of science, art, history, innovation that can all be found within what we do in food and beverage. And really leaning into that and appreciating the pursuit of knowledge getting to experiment together, getting to understand kind of how we make things. So when you walk onto Treaty Oak, it's 28 acres. This was a working cattle ranch when we bought it. Okay. And so all the buildings you see, we've actually done ourselves. 
You have Alice's Restaurant, which is named after my mom, since my parents owned a restaurant growing up. Our visitor center and cocktail lab. And then the distillery itself that we're in here is about 6,000 square feet. And then we have our first Rick House, which uh, we just filled up on barrels, about 3,000 barrels. And uh, we're starting construction on our next Rick House in two weeks now. It's amazing. It's been fun, for sure. It's really testament to the quality of the spirits that you're producing. How did all of this evolve to where you essentially have your miller on site? So James and I met back in 2017. I saw a small blurb about what he was doing and just getting started up. That was in one of the uh, local magazines. Uh, reached out to James, he came, and we started talking about different corns and grains that have been working together ever since. Daniel and I are very like-minded about wanting to be in close proximity to each other. It's a, well over a million pounds of grain a year that we need to source and mill for them in order to, to meet their production needs. Uh, so he was nice enough to make it very attractive to us to buy two and a half acres from him to build our new headquarters. And that's the building that is now built out. That was in June, and now it's functioning. So come on up. We're going to make a cocktail as the perfect way to kind of wrap up the live show. Please welcome to the stage these lovely ladies from Treaty Oak Distilling. Come on. Yay. There's the, here's your mic for you. Thank you are welcome. Thank you very much. Is it on? Hello, hello, hot mic, hello. Yeah, hot you're good. So introduce go. yourself. I'm Jamie Beal. I'm the Director of Science and Sustainability for Treaty Oak Distilling. I'm really happy to be here on behalf of Daniel Barnes and the whole crew. This is my homie Morgan. Um, <laughs> she's going to be mixing up drinks while I answer questions. <laughs> I have lots of questions I for bet. you. So, um, so let's talk about the Ghost Hill Bourbon. All of these uh, these barrels behind us say GHB. That That's means right. Ghost Hill Bourbon. So the Ghost Hill Bourbon is our Texas grain to glass. Um, we source our corn from the Texas Panhandle, courtesy of James Brown. Um, the soft red winter wheat comes uh, from outside of Cleburne. Um, we've met the farmers, had their families out to the to the distillery, um, so it's as important to us to have quality and responsibly sourced grains to make the best product possible as it is to make sure that we're keeping these local connections um, and making sure that we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is, um, literally and, and metaphorically. Well, so you mentioned the local connections. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think uh, it, it sounds very romantic. You know, we're, we're, we're connecting with all these local people, but what is the true impact of that? Because there is a real on the ground financial financial impact of, um, of having these local partnerships. Well, absolutely. Um, point one is that we're able to infuse our money back into our economy. Um, sustainability and corporate social responsibility is the term for just doing right, um, is, is what we stand for. And so to be able to, to put that money right back into where it came from. Um, Texas is a big state. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, but to be able to at least source from Panhandle, from Central Texas, um, and then and then have those folks out and 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 make sure that their kids are getting you know clothes and school supplies and um, all of that is is incredibly important to to what we represent as a company. And so also the sustainability piece. How does that play into what you are doing? Like what choices are you making to, um, to be sustainable as a distillery, which you're also a brewery and now you're also also working with um, Texas uh, wineries, right. uh, grape growers to make wine. That's right. The trifecta. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, come on out. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think to answer your question, um, to be making our, casting our vote um, fiscally uh, to these farmers, these ranchers, these wine growers uh, who are taking the care to allow their, their soil to rest. Um, they're not trying to maximize profit. They're trying to do things for the long game. Um, and we're in that too. Um, the outcome is the best quality product um, that tastes good and feels good. Um, but the point is, uh, you know, by, by coupling with um, farmers uh, that are into doing things the slow way, the old way, um, we're kind of breathing life back into the way that it was. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that we're on a path that is uns unsustainable. Um, to run a, a linear system on a finite planet is, 
it's not gonna work, right? So trying to close those loops however possible and slow down a little bit um, and, and take it back to what it was and do it right um, costs more, takes longer, um, but it's the only way we're gonna keep on going. And I don't know about y'all, but I wanna keep on drinking bourbon. <laughs> And you also end up with a better product in the end because you're not trying to get as quickly as possible right. to the end result and just get that revenue out. You really are trying to make the best product, yes. which it takes a slower, it's a slower, you know, uh, way to get to the end result, but you end up winning in the end. My daddy always said there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and he's right. Um, for it to be good, um, it takes longer. It's more expensive. It's done properly. Uh, and some of the some of the old folks know exactly what I'm talking about, but some of the younger ones have kind of grown up in this era of bigger, better, faster, uh, and think that's the way. Uh, and I'm here to say, resoundingly, it's not. Um, and I'm incredibly proud to be a part of this and a part partner with James and and all the other folks out here who know what we're talking about. Um, that in order to make quality and and have it be sustained, um, something you can drink or eat or enjoy uh, for generations is to do it the old way, to do it the right way. Uh, they had it right the first time around. Yeah. And I feel like this is really kind of the perfect way to end the show because when it, you know, like I said when we first started, you know, the reason why we have these makers markets as part of the the experience of Meet the Makers is that it's not just about watching the show. It's about creating those connections. And the way that this system works, this local food system, is not that you just think it's a great story and, you know, look at it on Instagram. It really is about going out out to your farmer's market, going to your local brewery, going, going to your local distillery, buying local bread, all of that is what makes this really hum. And it creates what I'm really struck by, and I'm so grateful to be able to come out and meet people like you. Um, what I'm struck by is the opportunities that this industry creates for people to work passionately in the food system. Like you're not just going in, checking into an office and going home at the end of the day. You show up every day like living your dream essentially and you know, being part of it. And that's what the local food economy allows to happen. So, right. Yeah, thank you again oh. for allowing me to say out loud that I live my dream every day. Um, I have the best job on the planet, hands down. Because you got um, the best bourbon. I think it's, I think you should talk about, <laughs> we should talk bourbon. about this old fashioned. So an old fashioned is, I love bourbon. And um, we actually have a ritual when we're on the road, we always go and find a local distillery and we usually find a really great bourbon to drink together. Um, so it's very fitting that we wrap up the show with this. So kind of tell us what the Happy old to. fashioned is and, and how you make it. So obviously it's gonna start with this Ghost Hill Bourbon. Um, in case you didn't hear, we're just down the road. Um, we have uh, whiskeys and we also have gins. We've got beer, we've got wine, we've got barbecue, all the good stuff. But this is made with um, Texas corn, Texas wheat, and coming soon to a bourbon near you, uh, <laughs> Texas malted barley. We're working on that as well. Um, it wouldn't be in this glass if it weren't for James Brown. So let's pause and appreciate the man. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Gen genuine friend, a uh, friend of mine. Um, but we start with this. Um, Morgan added a little bit of Angostura bitters. Um, bitters is your choice. There is no shortage of options, but we like Ango. It's a little bit orange forward. Um, we end up putting a splash of simple syrup, so that's a one-to-one -one sucrose to water mixture. You can use agave nectar, um, honey. The sweetening options are endless. Um, and then you just take a little bit of a, an orange peel and a little bit of a sweet a little maraschino cherry or whatever you're into, um, put it on a fat cube of ice and then cheers your good friend. Cheers. cheers. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you all of you for being cheers, here. Cheers. And to James. To James. Mm, that's good. I will be enjoying this cocktail. Um, and I think this is one of the absolute best ways to celebrate bourbon because it's so simple. Right. All it does is elevate the flavors. Right. So, and you guys also have a tent here. So we, uh, yeah, we got some bourbon to share. Yeah, you've got some stuff to share, so make sure that you stop by and, <clears throat> it's got me at the back of the throat, <laughs> I love that. 
um, say hi to Jamie and pick her brain about um, what they're doing at Treaty Oak because it, it really is, it's a game changer. It's pretty great. And it's yeah. my pleasure again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate I appreciate you. you. I gotcha. Okay, so I know you guys are anxious to go and explore and enjoy the Maker's Market. So I, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you very much to our sponsors, Edward Jones and Natural Tableware. We could not do this work without their support and spread these stories and create these connections. We have uh, well over a dozen fantastic local makers for you to enjoy. And again, it's just wearetastemakers.com. You can stream the episode. I'm easy to get in touch with if you have any ideas that you want me to share with me for season three. Thank you so much for joining us today. I love it. Thank you. I just love being here in Austin. It was great.